Chicksis Kucha Emma Kanye Rase Dalton Brown. Hello, good day. Uh, my name is Dalton Brown. Um, I introduce myself today in my Miwok language. Um, before I begin, I want to acknowledge that uh, today we are on Wekma Ohlone land. I want to acknowledge that um, and call them into the room and uh, ask that they be here with us today. Um, I'm going to talk about indigenous scholarship at Stanford University and the act of recruiting, admitting, and supporting native doctoral students. Give you a little code book, if you will, of terms I'll use today. Um, native, uh, I use indigenous in the first slide because that's the one I fall back on to be more formal, um, but it's queued up in my brain to use native much easier. Um, and that is any native student, Native American, Alaska Native, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, or any other form of indigenous who affiliates with the native community here at Stanford. I use the term uh, doctoral the entire time. It is enrolled in a doctorate granting degree program that is non-professional, so not the med school, not the law school. And then the NAC is the Native American Cultural Center. So our journey today, uh, I want to frame the NAC for you. It's where I've been working this quarter. Um, but then also jump into some research about Native doctoral students, uh, pull some data that I actually was able to get from our students here at the university, um, then walk you through it and see uh, how we can make the university a better place. So the Stanford Native American Cultural Center. It is one of four ethnic community centers at Stanford University. Uh, very, very intersectional, works with the Vice Provost for Student Affairs, works with Res Ed, Residential Dining and Enterprises. Um, it meets all the needs that it can of Native students here at Stanford, whether that be social, emotional, um, helping with financial, um, also provides food, which sometimes I think that's the number one. Um, <laughs> that's why everybody shows up. Um, it also houses dozens of student groups, uh, two of which stand out the most to me um, are the Stanford American Indian Organization and the Stanford Native American Graduate Students, SNAGS. Um, specifically, graduate students at the NAC, uh, there's one full-time person who is tasked with serving graduate students, and that is Greg Graves. Um, Greg is the newly minted Assistant Director for Student Affairs and the Associate Director of the NAC. Previously, and up until recently, he was the Graduate Student Retention and Recruitment Coordinator. There's a graduate student office full with a computer, a couple chairs. 95% of the time I'm on campus, if I'm not in class, I live in there. Um, I, I actually had a pillow at one point. Um, there's two graduate student liaison positions that work with the full-time staff as students um, for hourly pay. Um, I occupy one of those positions. Um, it's a way of involving graduate students in the community. There's also two really big things that graduate students and doctoral students are involved in. Uh, one of them is the Frosch Fellow Program, which pairs freshman students with typically doctoral, sometimes master's students, such as myself, um, and the freshmen who want to pursue research projects. For a couple quarters, they work on their own research, supported by the Frosch Fellow Mentors, which they eventually present at the SPARC Research Forum. SPARC, and I'm going to try and get this right, stands for Student Projects Accelerating and Reshaping Knowledge. It was a rebrand this year because Research Forum just sounded boring. Um, and that's an opportunity where graduate students and undergraduate students alike from all communities have an opportunity to share their unique research. Um, or if they have their stuff together, they can practice their polls project, something I didn't do. <laughs> so, yeah. So this is a quote from the Dean of the School of Humanities and Sciences. And I'm sorry, Kyle, I'm going to read it. So, I think it really stands out as something that shows people in the Stanford community are dedicated to Native scholarship. We have a moral obligation to support top quality education and research for and about the peoples who lived here before universities arrived. Stanford enrolls more Native students than other top private research universities and we need to serve them with a core of faculty who will inspire their intellectual passions. This comes from a brochure that has been selectively distributed to uh, stakeholders in what is going to be the proposed Native Excellence Center. The Native Excellence Center on Stanford University's campus is proposed as a physical space that houses two full-time faculty as well as staff and offers fellowships for Native doctoral scholarship. This, uh, highlights the timeline of important events at the university. In 1894, Stanford graduated its very first native student in John Milton Oskison. Uh, that is the second graduating class, thir third, I have to take that back, to pass through the university. Um, and we now have a writing award in his name. 
1971, Stanford University organized its very first student-run powwow, uh, something that you all know is very close to my heart, uh, having been a co-chair of it. Um, we are now the largest student-run powwow in the country, um, and the sixth largest overall. Um, in 1972, Stanford, due to student action, became the first academic institution to do away with the Stanford Indians mascot. Uh, in 1990, before it was federally required, Stanford took the uh, onus upon themselves and returned and repatriated over 500 ancestral remains to the local Maloney tribe. And the university was very, very involved in that decision. Our own director of heritage services and the campus archaeologist drove the truck herself. Today we have over 300 native students, which is by far the most students out of any top tier research university. Another project that underwent this year was the SNAP program. And what this was, headed by the head of the SNAGS group, Sandy Jono, our fearless leader, uh, put this together to engage undergraduate students in what it looks like to have a career in higher education, mostly doctoral pipelines. Um, it was a great turnout, and there's a huge, huge buzz around supporting undergraduate students into graduate study. So if we look at the numbers of the university, and I'll switch sides because I know I take up way more space than other people in this program. <laughs> So if we look at the numbers, you're all tall and slender, and then there's me. Uh, so at the undergraduate level, we do really, really well. 2.9% of our undergraduate population identifies as native. That's about 202 students, and we are really proud of that. And then, at the graduate level, 0.7% identify as native. That's about 66 students. And that's graduate. But wait, there's more. Like I said, that is graduate. If we look at the degree breakdown of graduate degrees here at Stanford University, 21% of them that are awarded are doctoral. With 0.7% of all graduate degrees being native, it's about 66 students. Anybody in here teach math? No? Something? What's it? About 21%? Uh, 14. The number is 14 by the numbers of doctoral native students at Stanford University. And I keep using the phrase, by the numbers, and I'll get to that. But according to the data, it should be about 14. This isn't an isolated incident. In 2014, only 109 doctoral level degrees were granted to native students in the United States. Students like this, and this is a photo from this year's powwow, students like this, native students in the United States, are the least likely to attend college they are the most likely to drop out of high school. They have a suicide rate 2.5 times the national average. What can be done to remove those barriers so that students like this access a graduate degree, a doctoral degree? Got to find the problem. According to the research, and you don't have to boil it all down, I've got you down here. <laughs> yeah, You're going to glaze at it and then it's at the bottom. So the importance of meeting students where they're at. There's an inherent mismatch between institutions of higher education and native student values. According to these researchers, support cannot and should not end once students hit college. Once students get to college at the undergraduate or graduate level, support needs to kick into overdrive so that students do not experience culture shock and they do not feel lost <laughs> flounder in their university. This one, this is some of the only research I could find about native students in doctoral programs. Very, very limited research. Mentorship and support were the most important aspects of people choosing to pursue graduate degrees and choosing to continue to pursue their doctoral degrees. Adrienne Keene, a Stanford alum, now faculty at Brown University, um, in her evaluation of a culturally grounded pre-college access program said this. I know that's a lot of text. So I've gone ahead and I've done that for you. <laughs> so we're going to pull out some of the things about imparting skills, helping students and faculty think through what it means uh, to be a college-bound Native student, helping students realize that higher education and Native student values do not have to exist in opposition to one another, and also being a source of strength in a predominantly white college environment. Like I said, in a predominantly white college environment. So supporting students when they're here is key. The data wasn't always there, so I went and got some myself. We'll start with this. 
My n was 12. And I used the phrase by the numbers earlier, and this is why. I got 12 responses, and I am pretty confident that is all of them. Very, very confident that is all of them. And I keep using very confident, and I can't be 100% sure because the data just isn't readily available. So a survey, I got 12 native doctoral students at this university. 42% of them said that their research affects native communities in some way or another. 56% of them have some sort of worry about their finances that would disable them from completing their degree. 67% of them currently do not access the Native American Cultural Center. 33% of them have a native faculty advisor, while 91% of them think that having a native faculty advisor would be beneficial in one way or another. 100% of them support the development of an undergraduate to graduate pipeline. 92% of them themselves were not part of an undergraduate to graduate pipeline. Well, 92% thought that mentorship was incredibly important in the application process. So there's a lot of numbers and a lot of data on the screen. So we'll pull these four out. Found our problem. Low number of native doctoral students. Found a root cause. A lack of pipeline support. Found another one. Financial fears. Inability to complete their degree. As well as a lack of connection to the community here at Stanford with only 67% of them accessing the Native Center. So we have our root causes. Now we'll dive in a little bit more and see what each of them holds. We have our lack of pipeline support, our financial fears, and a lack of connection. The lack of pipeline support. Currently, Stanford University does not offer an official pipeline program. All pipeline programs, both for undergraduates and graduates, are unofficial word-of-mouth relationships that Greg at the NAC has been able to develop during his time here, supporting students and telling them, well, this is a program that can tell you about graduate school, or relying when somebody is applying for a graduate degree program here or a doctoral program here, relying on them to reach out to him and ask for support in the process. There's nothing official that makes that happen. There's also a huge lack of data that is given to Greg and to the NAC about Native students, where they're applying from, what their chances are of being admitted, what their funding looks like. There's nothing. The financial fears. As many of us know, just doing masters, it is very, very difficult to balance workload, any form of a social life, as well as trying to finance your degree, um, which leaves very, very little room for connection to any community, much less your native community, which connects more here. I keep using connection. It's very, very, very difficult to find our native graduate students, whether they be in their lab, they be taking care of families, what have you. It is very, very challenging to know who our native graduate students are because the data is really poor. Institutional research does not always get data to the NAC, and it is very difficult to reach out to each of the graduate schools and ask for that data because sometimes they don't want to release it. And also, just like I said, a lack of time and ability to engage in community sometimes causes a separation of people not being fully uh, a part of the institution. So how do we fix it? We have our problems and we have uh, where they come from, but how do we fix it? My first recommendation of the action plan is the creation of a formal relationship with this group, Graduate Horizons. I'm going to give you a second to read it uh, because I think it's really, really important um, more or less it boils down to it is a four-day boot camp, if you will, for native undergraduates and recent uh, graduates of undergrad institutions to learn about the graduate degree uh, application process as well as prepare them for the GRE, MCAT, LSAT, things like that, but also give them information about what graduate degree programs look like at different institutions. Um, so every other summer it's hosted at a different campus. And interestingly, interestingly enough, uh, Stanford University does not have a formal relationship with Graduate Horizons, has never hosted them here for the summer, yet our competitors, um, rhymes with Schmarvard on the East Coast, <laughs> they have done this, um, which is something really interesting that we are actually behind the ball on. This is a big one, um, and it's, it's a little radical because it involves dollars. Um, <laughs> A, uh, and this is a quote from somebody I met with, a fully funded doctoral applicant is really attractive to admissions. Especially in the case of native students, it signals that they have very little to risk 
and everything to gain by admitting the student. And that's because if we think of it this way, like I said, Stanford University does an incredible job of recruiting and admitting. But the problem here is that once they're here as undergrads, because of this, what they throw around called academic incest, very little, there are very little instances of undergraduates staying for graduate degrees, especially at the doctoral level straight through. And because we are getting some of the, the cream of the crop, as you, if you will, of undergrads, we only have our Ivy League uh, institutions on the East Coast to try and pull from. And having students not funded in the application process, it's difficult and challenging for students from the Arizona State Universities, the Oklahoma States, these native community hubs, their chances of being admitted are even lower than those at the Ivy League institutions. The fellowships that I'm proposing would be controlled by the Native Community Center so that contingent upon admission, students would have full funding for the time of their degree, but they would also work as liaisons in the NAC. They would work to create an under undergraduate pipeline program. And this one, and I, and I use this image because it's hard for Greg to try and do his job when the university is only giving him so much to do, pushing a boulder up that hill. So the importance of getting better data. I combed through as much as I could. I combed through the native graduate student listserv that they used to announce. There are students on there that graduated five years ago and now work at the university. It is very tough to try and find by name on any list who our graduate students are unless they come to the community. That makes it really hard to make them a part of our community. Also, the strength relationship between institutional research and the NAC can go a long way of seeing what communities, what undergraduate institutions are sending their native students here as a way of creating better pipelines and better relationships with them. So we'll get down to the dollars and cents of things. Our relationship with college horizons, graduate horizons, not nil. No, we can do that. That's a couple emails and a handshake and we actually can formalize something. Better data reporting, a little laborious on the part of the university and on the part of institutional research, but it can be done. The other one, just raw number guessing from uh, the budget allocated by the university to support three new doctoral students in the native community, fully funded for about five years, would run about $900,000. And in normal people dollars, that's a lot of money. And in Stanford dollars, that's not a lot of money when you think of it this way, that there are tens of million dollars currently being allocated for other graduate pipeline programs. So that's not too bad. So we have our solutions for success. We want to strengthen our pipelines, control a doctoral fellowship, bring people into the community, but also get better data. I want to end with this quote from Vine Deloria Jr. about what it means to be educated uh, as a native person. Every society needs educated people, but the primary responsibility of educated people is to bring wisdom back into the community and make it available so that the lives they are leading make sense. With that, I say, Makasi, thank you. Thank you for this. Uh, I really appreciate it because I hate to say that uh, in all my talk about social justice and equity, I rarely ever even think about Native students. So thank you for making this a priority. Um, I have a question about um, academic incest as yeah. uh, a reason for why this pipeline doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to imagine what it means, but could you add some more clarity? Yeah, so the, uh, <laughs> yeah, I know. It's a weird term to just throw out in the middle of a presentation uh, without explanation. <laughs> I just hit you with that and I'll move on. Um, <laughs> So the way it was explained to me is the idea that when somebody has invested, I'll use myself as an example, was when you, the university has just invested five years in educating me, why are they going to keep me around for another five years when I've already taken all their knowledge but I offer them nothing new? When bringing in somebody from another institution, they have four or five years of knowledge from that institution, they can then contribute to their graduate degree in contributing to the, the academia that happens there. Does that make sense a little bit? Okay. Thanks, yeah. Dalton. That was wonderful. Um, I'm wondering, from the beginning of your presentation, you mentioned that you were not including graduate students in professional schools, so yeah. law school, medical school. And I'm curious, are they doing better or worse? Are there lessons that maybe could be drawn from 
um, from those other graduates? It's, it's also relatively low. Um, I can think of a couple people at the law school. See you in the back. Um, but then uh, also uh, two, maybe three people at the med school. Um, so it's tough. Master's level, uh, because of the co-term degree program they have here, I think there's six of us co-term degree students this year. So that's a start, but in the scheme of things, not that much. I'm really curious about this funding issue. Um, so I thought it was really great that you proposed the kind of like community grants to start that pipeline. Um, I'm wondering like the relationship between funding and kind of like legitimacy in academia. And is there a, I know the N is smaller, only 12 students, um, but have you noticed any patterns in terms of like what they're studying and whether there's like general funding you know, NSF grants in general, or is it that they're doing things that are relatively unfunded? Um, it's really, here at uh, Stanford, it's very diverse. Uh, we have students who are getting their doctorates in like neurobiology. Um, we have a couple students who it's like anthropology, archaeology, um, then a couple students here at the Ed School. Um, so it's really, really diverse. Um, I know at other institutions that have doctoral degree programs in Native American studies or race and ethnicity, there are higher instances of Native students, but I figured that I only had so much time to run through things, but if I had it my way, you know, there would be a lot more um, community-driven academia that happened here. My question kind of piggybacks off of Andrea's. Um, if the PhDs are fully funded here, I guess I'm struggling to kind of understand why Stanford needs a separately endowed scholarship uh, to bring in Native students whom they recognize that at least an undergraduate level provides so much diversity to the campus. Yeah. Um, is there just maybe more pressure that needs to be placed on a graduate level to do the same sorts of things that they're able to do for undergrads? Or is this more of like a financial aid versus what we deem as academically veritable in, in the graduate level divide? Yeah, I, I think that the, the idea of a funding fellowship actually serves to uh, bolster students in the academic, like in the application process for their uh, PhD, uh, mostly because, uh, like I said, like students who are coming and applying here to get their PhD but have a 3.0 from Arizona State, like chances are, like they stand a like way less chance than a student who is applying from Harvard or a student who is applying from Dartmouth. So by supporting students who are doing community-based research that the Native community values and supporting them financially, it signals to the university in the admissions process that there is somebody like, there to support them um, and, and bolster their academic work, kind of as a fail-safe sort of thing. So it doesn't, they're not gonna admit them and then the student flounder and end up, you know, uh, leaving. Time for one more question. Or not, either way. <laughs> <laughs> We're not, thank you yeah, very cool. much. Thank you.